Welcome. At Memorial, we want to do two things. Learn to know and follow Christ and invite others to do the same. What we mean by that is we want everyone to become all that God intends for them to become and not settle for anything less. Our hope is that everyone feels that our church is a place where you can come and belong. Welcome to the worship service this morning. We are so glad you're here and may God receive all the glory as we worship together. Well, you may have heard this name before, of course. Charles Spurgeon was known as the Prince of Preachers. One reason he was known for that is he preached uh, 3,600 sermons. I have a ways to go to get to that number. And he published 49 volumes of commentaries. He would pastor uh, pastor a church that would pack over 5,000 people to uh, hear him preach. What you may not have known about his personal life is that he suffered from chronic gout that caused him immense pain throughout uh, most of his adult life. And uh, you may not know this either, but he actually uh, suffered from a depression as well. And Spurgeon, like others that suffer from depression, may have been a result of a tragedy that he went through. And he really rallied through it all and was able to continue to preach Uh, But he said this, and I thought it was fitting for today. In the night of sorrow, believers are like nightingales. They sing in the darkness. And listen, church, many of us have had a difficult year this year. And 2022 was rough in a number of ways, but we can sing in the darkness. And that's what we're doing today. Uh, Because of God's faithfulness, we can thank God in the dark, and we can thank God in the light. And Paul and Silas, in our passage today, will give us a tremendous example of just that. If you would turn with me in Acts chapter 16, and we'll begin with really what is more a sermonette than a sermon today, Uh, but Acts chapter 16, and we will see... In this first part of our time today, uh, that they were in the right place at the right time. Verses 16 through 18 in Acts chapter 16. It says this, As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having been greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. Now this was a really a, a large con- was not sorry a lo- not a large congregation of people in Philippi and these men were however were dedicated to their time of prayer. And the point of these first 3 verses I want to make this morning is that they were in the right place at the right time. They were where they should be and that was in prayer. See rarely do you hear uh, from someone then that that might say here I, yeah I want to uh, go to a place of prayer I want to spend time in prayer and rarely do you hear back unless it's a neglect of responsibility yeah yeah that's a bad idea no one's going to say that to you it's always a good idea to be in prayer that is always the right place at the right time to pray and that's what we find these men doing And as we think through the idea of being thankful, it starts with that. It starts with being in the right place at the right time. And you might find yourself at this time of of Thanksgiving weekend having trouble being thankful. So let me ask you, where are you? Are you in the right place at the right time? Are you struggling with maybe sin in your life? Are you struggling with pride Are you discontent? Are you simply neglectful of that wonderful gift that God has given us, which is prayer? So when your heart is struggling towards thankfulness, think about the actions, the the words, the activities of your life. And that plays into how thankful we are. 
Are you in the right place and are you in the right time? See, God knew this little girl would be there at the same time that, that Paul and Silas and apparently Luke was there with them as they arrived and, and these missionaries were in the right place. This is where God wanted them to be. And the little girl knew that these men were different, different, and it really might be more correct. The, the demons that resided inside of her knew they were different. See, for her whole life, these terrible men owned her and would use her gifts for their own gain, for their own profit, to, to pad their pockets. Talk about evil. They used her as a slave for their own gain, but but not the men that came alongside her, not Paul and Silas. And that was noticed. And you live a godly life. You live a life of gratitude towards the Lord. You live a life of service to our Father God. Even your enemies will notice that. And that's what's happening here. But as the days went by... And there were days here where the uh, young girl was continually uh, speaking to Paul and Silas. And uh, one of the uh, commentaries that I read, Richard Loggenecker points this out. He says this, While the demon-inspired words provided some free publicity for the missionaries and helped gather an audience, when it continued for many days, it became a nuisance. And the demon's words were getting more of a hearing than a proclamation of the gospel. So really, Paul and Silas needed to put an end to this, and finally, Paul releases the girl from her, her torment. I, I studied that word annoyed because I was like, well, that's not very nice. <laughs> this is a little girl that uh, is being really tormented by uh, demons living inside of her, and she's just really pleading for help in a way and hanging around Paul and Silas over and over again. And when you read that in the ESV, and it was really Paul annoyed by her. And as you study that, it's not, that's not true. It was, the word actually means to be disturbed and to be grieved. And so Paul was grieved at heart by what was happening to this little girl. And he made a change in her life that really spurred the events of Acts chapter 16 by helping this little girl and how she was uh, being used improperly, how she was suffering. And that's how we get to our wrong accusation and really a wrong punishment in the life of Paul and Silas. If we turn back to our passage in verse 19, let's read verses 19 through 24, and we see a wrong accusation and definitely a wrong punishment. Verse 19 says this, but when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. And the crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrate tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now basically what is happening here is Paul has just ripped up the lottery ticket for these men. It would be like if it was the winning lottery ticket and he just threw it into the ocean. These men were making so much money off of this young girl. Needless to say, these quote-unquote businessmen were not in a thanksgiving mood after this happened. It says these men seized and dragged Paul and Silas before the rulers. And really, there was a complete wrong accusation in verse 20. These men accused Paul and Silas of disturbing our city. No, wrong. Completely wrong. What they did was they helped a disturbed child. How much is the truth twisted here? 
And then it escalated really to racial prejudice. It's, it's the Jews that are against this, our Roman law. So this became a racial, religious, and ethnic controversy. And nothing is said about who? The little girl. The, the prophet lost. Instead, there was anti-Semitism that comes into play quite heavily. So the men lie. It's really the, the oldest trick in the book. It's how Jesus was brought to trial. It was the same for Stephen, right? They brought these lies to the magistrates, to the rulers. And if you bring enough lies and you bring enough lies in the accusations, uh, then they'll be brought to trial. And that's what happened with Paul and Silas. I find it interesting, though, isn't it ironic that, that Paul and Silas were the ones of causing civil unrest when these men were literally promoting a us versus them. They were literally promoting a mob mentality, and they're like saying, hey, these guys are disturbing the city, yet a fight breaks out because of what they say. Basically, they say, well, they're thinking, if, if we bring them in the middle of town and start yelling things, they hate Romans, they hate Romans, what do you think is going to happen? They get a crowd of people that will bring mob justice upon these two men for their lost wages. That's all they saw with this young girl, unfortunately. And what happens next, it's really hard to read, isn't it? It is the wrong punishment for what they've done. And the crowds begin to beat these missionaries. They are stripped of their clothes. They are beat with rods and they are thrown into a prison dungeon. And as we spoke of Spurgeon's words earlier, and we really sang songs that really pointed to this point very much so, talk about being in the darkness. Then their feet were placed in stocks. I think I have a picture for you to show you. Uh, and really, you might say, okay, that's not really a big deal because you've been to Disney World and other places that you put your hands in those things and take a picture, right? Well, the, the difference here is this. If you go back a few verses, you realize that these men were beaten on their backs and they had open wounds on their backs. So now they're being placed in stocks where their feet are placed up in those stocks. And what happens with gravity? Gravity begins to take place. They be, they're so weak from what the beatings that happened. They begin to what? They begin to recline on the backs that were just beaten. So that's what's happening. They're not just in jail. They're not just having their feet fastened into these stocks, but they are in immense pain. So Paul and Silas had every reason to be angry, to be scared, or even confused at what God is doing. And as we just sang that and we heard from testimonies, right? God, what are you doing? But it's fitting to our Thanksgiving service to see their reaction. And the testimonies that were shared today very much fit this. To be thankful anytime to be thankful anywhere. Very difficult thing to do, but we see that in our passage today in verse 25. If we could read the final parts of our passage. Verse 25 through 34. It says this, About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. And the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And he spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in the house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that had believed in God. What a story. Incredible. Now, instead of complaining, Paul and Silas did what? They sang and they prayed to God. They sang praises to God. 
beaten and immense pain from the wounds, placed in torturous positions, and they sang and they praised God. And can you imagine that? These men who could barely breathe, but with each breath that they could have, they strained to give God praise for all to hear. Did you notice that in our passage? The other prisoner were like, what? Wow, we can hear them. This was stereo sound. This was not Paul and Silas just singing these songs. Oh, Lord, can you help us? No, this was... I'm not going to sing any louder because I'm going to hurt your ears. <laughs> but they were singing loudly so all the prisoners could hear it. What a testimony. And Paul and Silas exchanged their groans and moans for praise and glory. It's so convicting, isn't it? And God shook the earth and the doors opened and their bonds were unfastened and they had freedom and Paul and Silas did what? I feel like they did enough there. They were already singing praises to God. They were already praying to him. That's right. We'll get there in a second. Thank you. Okay. That's right. So they, they just stayed there. They stayed put. And if I'm honest, if I was Silas, I would be like, Hey, hey, Paul, we, we were singing and praising, and we were doing all the good things, and, and, and we have good hearts here, and, and let's make a break for it. <laughs> and then Paul likely would have said to me, if I was Silas, he said, no, we can't do that, because that jailer over there needs Jesus. I'd say, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, the, the guy that just beat us to the inch of, last inch of our life, you want to go talk to him, see that door, see these things that are, un let's just, no, it wasn't like that. And by staying, they saved the jailer's life. I mean, what good is your mansion in heaven if you can't invite anyone over? See, the punishment for losing prisoners was death. And the uh, prison guard knew that. And when the prison doors opened, likely he figured everyone is gone. The prisoners had, have left. My life is over. And before he could take his own life, Paul stops him, saves his earthly life, and then shares with him eternal and Paul shared this simple gospel here. Isn't it just beautiful what he says there? Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. He simply said to believe, which that word means to, to trust, to rely on, to, to cling to. And that's what the jailer did. And not only did the jailer believe, but what else happened? We, someone mentioned that possibly. The whole family believed. And they were baptized. Talk about a Thanksgiving here, right? Now, uh, wives, if your husband was a jailer and he decided to bring his prisoners home for dinner, um, I mean, she might be a little surprised at that. <laughs> and she brought the prisoners home from the prison that have just shared the gospel news, and she went with it. And so did the whole family, and they all trusted Christ, and what a day that was. In horrible circumstances, Paul and Silas were able to witness so much good, and they were able to be so very thankful. What a testimony. I'm going to close with this. A little boy was asked by his father to say grace at the table and sometimes that is a dangerous question <laughs> and while the rest of the family uh, waited um, the, this little guy kind of was looking around and and eyeing the every dish of food that his mother had prepared and after his examination he bowed his head and he honestly prayed lord i don't like the looks of it but I thank you for it, and I'll eat it anyway. Amen. 
<laughs> I kind of chuckle because it might have been your own recent exper experience at your own family Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> but here's the point. Listen, church, sometimes we do look around at our lives. We examine what is going on around us. And if we're honest, we don't like the looks of it. But we can still thank God for it because of his faithfulness and because, all, because of all the good that has come from it. May we sing in the darkness. May we rejoice in the light. And may every day be Thanksgiving Day because of our Father God in heaven. Let's pray. Lord, again, we offer up this service to you in thankfulness for all that you have done. Lord, we sing you praises even in the darkness. But Lord, you have given us so much good that we can't overlook that. And we look around and we see your grace. We look around and we see your mercy. We look around and we see your love for us. And we thank you for it. And we thank you for all the good that has come from it. Lord, as we go through difficult things, if we knew what you know, we'd be thanking you right away. You are in control. You have a plan. And we trust it. And we thank you for the good that can come from it. We love you so very much. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining us. I hope you felt welcome and challenged by God's word and were blessed by our time in worship. At Memorial Baptist Church, we strive to invite people to know and follow Christ. And our YouTube channel is one of the ways we do just that. So please feel free to subscribe down below and share it with others. If you'd like to learn more about NBC, visit our website at nbconline.org. And if you'd like to give to our ministries here at Memorial, there's a link below to do just that as well. We hope to see you again soon.